morning everybody. Thank you for having me here this morning. I was actually telling Prof Maharaj that I'm, I'm very grateful that he invited me, otherwise I'd still be in Ghana. The African Data Protection Conference is, is taking place there and we had our closed sessions yesterday and the day before. So uh, I did manage to sneak out because of this engagement. So thank you, Prof. <laughs> that is why I'm, I'm here today. Uh, my presentation is going to be more of a, a, a discussion, not so necessarily a presentation on the sections. Yes, it will be dealing with sections, but I want to leave you with a thought. Uh, it's more an abstract out of the current research work that I'm doing. Um, I was at some stage very much into e-commerce. That was in the early 2005s, and then at some stage I wandered into cybercrime and cybersecurity, and I was tired of that, and now I find myself in data protection. Um, and then at some stage I decided to do my doctorate, and I said, why not combine all of these things? Because you need to do something you know. Because I spoke to my father, and he said, my son, don't look for a topic you don't know. Look for something you do know, and, and put them together. So that is the topic for my today, the intersection between data protection and cyber security. Just before I go into the slides, I always say um, data protection, in particular the cyber security aspect of data protection, as well as cyber security, they all come from a common ancestor, um, as well as cyber crime. And that common ancestor is called vulnerability. Right? So they are not brothers and sisters but they're cousins. They do share some genetic misgivings, uh, and it's for that reason that I believe that they need to be discussed and looked at uh, more in detail. Now, just a little bit about the information regulator. I wasn't gonna come here and not talk about the information regulator, even although I have to be careful. It's a thin line, myself, the regulator, so I'll try and keep that. So the regulator, of which I'm a member of as well, uh, they are the ones going to be the custodians of data protection as well as access to information. Um, we are going to be dispensing, or the information regulator better put, are going to be dispensing same in terms of POPIA, the Protection of Personal Information Act, as well as PIA, which is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Uh, that is currently being done by the Human Rights Commission, but the powers will be coming to us. The scope and application of POPIA applies to any processing of personal information by a responsible party. A responsible party is the South African version of a data controller. You know the GDPR? They speak of a data controller. We don't talk of a data controller. We speak of a responsible party. So as much as we have data subjects, you and I are data subjects, the person processing the personal information would be the responsible party. POPIA takes precedence over <coughs> legislation pertaining to the protection of personal information. Uh, there are just very, very few pieces of legislation where there are exceptions. Right. Like I said, we call the data subject, you and I, the, the subject of the data is the data subject, and then the person processing the data is the responsible party, and the operator will be the person processing the personal information on behalf of the responsible party. Uh, just to give you a practical application of, of this scenario, the, the matter of uh, the Black Sash versus Sasa and others, where the Office of the Information Regulator was cited as the eighth respondent, it had to do with the use of personal information of grant beneficiaries. So we had the data subject, the grant beneficiaries, whose personal information was given to the responsible party, which is SASA, or the data controller in terms of GDPR, which was processing personal information of the data subject in order to give them grants. But because they don't have infrastructure, they had a operator doing so by the name of Net1 and CPS. Cut a long story short, the <laughs> responsible party was ordered to put in um, safety guards in terms of protection of personal information in order to ensure that there are no abuses of the personal information. 
right? Without going into the case too much, the court found that there were abuses of the personal information with regards to direct marketing, uh, as well as further use, unauthorized use of personal information. The word processing, in terms of uh, papia, has got a wide definition. As you can see, it means any operation or activity or set of operations, uh, the collecting, receiving, recording, organizing, the list goes on. If you go in papia, it's well defined. It's a very wide definition of processing. Whereas personal information, as you see there as well, it means any personal information of an identifiable, living, natural person. An identifiable, living, natural person. Now, because of our horizontal and vertical application of the Bill of Rights, we have a very strange situation in our country. We also have a juristic person that can be a data subject. Right? It is a novelty in terms of the, the data protection law. We will see how we are going to get around it and how we are going to develop the law around that as the regulator does its work. And once again, the, the scope of what is personal information, extremely wide. Information relating to race, gender, sex, national origin, social origin, language, your education, the fact that you had Asian woodwork, that's your business, medical <laughs> status, financial history, the fact that the sheriff was at your house to come and pick up the car, that is your personal information. Any identifying number, symbol, email address, your physical address, telephone number, location information, all of those who have their smartphones on, like I just now, because I was telling Mr. McLachlan, I was sending him a live location, and not just did I tell him, but I told the other users, and I also told Facebook in the process, and Google in the process. So. Um, it's a lot of personal information, correspondence sent to one person to another. The list is endless, and once again, it is clearly defined in the Act, so I don't want to, to sit there too far. However, there's a very in, uh, interesting word, included but not limited to. Is there anyone who studied at the University of Pretoria here? No? Yes? Do you remember Professor Kushka? She would say there is no numerus clausus, therefore, it means this is not a closed number. In other words, what protection of personal information is, or better put, the personal information, is all of these things as per the Act, but not limited to that. In other words, it could be anything else, right? That is not per se listed in here. So there's no numerus clausus. I think it's a nice way of putting it. Now let's get to the meat. There are. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine <coughs> principles uh, in terms of data protection. Can I remove this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, we have the principle of accountability, and we have the principle of process limitation. So accountability is very straightforward. If you process personal information, you are accountable to the data subject. Am I correct? Right. Yes, we're doing Poppy 101 in 25 minutes. <laughs> process limitation means you can only process the information for the intended purpose that you got it to. And obviously, consent is also fitted into that. Then we have purpose specific. So once you have gotten the information, you can only use it for that specific purpose that you asked it for. There's also a limitation on further processing, which means that once you are done processing the personal information for the intended purpose, you cannot then now go and process it further. Um, example, you give your blood sample to a lab. You want to test for a particular disease. The doctor gives you your results. End of story, right? The purpose has been fulfilled. Then, the doctor fails to have proper safety guards of his dustbin, all right? I'm just skipping the principles, but we'll get back. He, has, he doesn't know how to dispose of all his reports properly. He doesn't have a shredder. So he's got this bad habit of taking all of his material, uh, be it uh, biomaterial or written material, and he disposes it in the dustbin outside, right? And because we're in 2019, we don't only steal credit cards, but we actually go into people's dustbins and we steal their ID numbers and we do all sorts of stuff, right? So that would be further processing when someone then goes and gets those results and uses them for other purposes. Information quality 
If you have my personal information, you must maintain it properly. Openness, you need to work with me. You need to let me know that my information is being processed. Classical example, if you go on a website, newspapers, what pops up? Cookie notification, isn't it? Right? And then what do they force you to do if you want to use their website? You must agree. Strangely enough, the Act talks about voluntary consent, but that's the topic of another day. As to whether you are voluntarily doing so is another issue. One may argue that, yeah, well, volenti non fit in urea. In other words, you've put yourself there, you wanted the service, therefore you've given consent to deal with it. But there's other schools of thought. Then we have safety and security guards, and that's the, the, the crux of today's topic, and data subject participation. So this particular principle, security safeguards, is very interesting to me. By the way, here's a synopsis of this. You will get a copy of this slide. This is very much public information. It's very much copied and pasted from the Act. Therefore, it can be publicly shared, right? <laughs> um, cyber security safety guards. Okay, so the Act in particular, if I can just flip flop, going to uh, 19 to 22. Can everyone see what's being written here? Security safety guard, right? Security measures on the integrity and confidentiality of data processed by the operator or person under the authority, then security measures of the operator, and then also notification of security breaches, or better put, data breaches, okay? So we're going to deal with sections 19 to 22 because those are the cyber security sections. There is another cyber security section there on transporter flow of information, but I don't want to go in that deep. I don't have the time to do that. If you do want to do so, there's a new textbook on data protection. A more Berger Schmidt colleague from here, Santon, just forgot which law firm, a competition, so it's not important. <laughs> the, What's important is that I gave you the author's name. <laughs> yeah, she, she has a beautiful exposition on section 19 to 22 on the safety and security guards dealing also with the additional sections on transporter. So section 19 <coughs> says that a person must have security measures on the integrity and confidentiality. What, what really strikes me in that section, it talks about technical and organizational um, methods. In other words, what is technical? Technical is your firewalls. Technical is your whatever software is, your hardware is. Whatever technical infrastructure that you put in place to have your data secure. But what exactly is organizational? And that is one of the things that I thought one has to have a look at. Most data breaches don't happen because of an intentional act, but because they happen of negligence. Negligence attributes to who? An individual or persons. Hence, organizational measures. So these organizational measures that we're talking about, we're not talking about how to manage the data itself, technically, but we're talking about how managing the person who's processing the personal information in order that it is kept safely. <coughs> Does that make sense, what I'm saying? No? You said no? Can I explain myself? Oh, I should not Okay, good. <laughs> because I was going to. <laughs> Like I said, this is my new pet project, okay? So it, it focuses on two elements. To say that as individuals, we need to ourselves do a mind shift. Not only do we have to do a mind shift to say that Popia is a reality. By the way, you don't choose and copy which part of Popia you choose, okay? So you don't wake up and say on Monday, yeah, I'm gonna be accountable. On Tuesday, yeah, we'll do process limitation. And then on Wednesday, you don't choose. They are all there, right, at the same time. So there has to be a mind shift already of saying we need to protect data. And what is also important is there is a big fallacy, and I want to break this fallacy, that data protection only relates to digital data. Whoever said that to you, whoa. Or ever planted that seed, whoa. Kill that weed. Kill it, right? The Data protection relates also to hard copies of documents. Classical case, I'm a lawyer, I walk into my firm, all my subordinates are sitting on their tables with a whole lot of files. 
this file is open, that file is open, this file's documents may be flowing into that one, and whilst we're at it, this one is consulting with a client and he has the other client's file open, whew, that is all in breach of data protection. So I have to come in after a big session at the regulator. Remember, I have to go and convince people to do this. So I need to lead by example. So I once went into my office and I said, people, from now on, this is how it's going to run. No one shares passwords with no one. If a person goes to the loo, you put your screen on password. If you work with a file, you work with the file. If you're done with the file, you take it back to the cupboard. You don't have two files at one moment because it may so happen that one document flows into the other and then it so happens that the other client fires you and you don't have time to check that other document that leaked into the other one and you have a data breach. See? We once had a complaint at the regulator. I can't tell you who it was because we keep them strictly anonymous, especially now because they are self-reporting uh, and they're doing voluntarily so, but a insurance company were moving hard copies of their policy applications. In other words, the forms that you apply with the financial advisor, together with the pay slips and whatever other instructions that they were given, and copies of IDs. And so initially when we got this thing, we we're like, but so what? So what if their truck got hijacked? <laughs> and then 15 minutes later, we looked at each other and we we're like, but wait a minute. Did, did they just say a truck with 14,000 applications? And then we continued reading, and then there's like our IDs, pay slips, debit orders, account numbers, and, and then it hit us. We were like, actually, whoever hit the truck actually hit the jackpot, you know? Uh, maybe they did hit the wrong truck, but they got the jackpot in terms of the information, because personal information is gold. So it's very important to look at cybersecurity measures. Now, once we have dealt with the, the human factor, Right? In the event of a cybersecurity breach, right? Prof? Oh, I thought you were saying that. In, in the event of a cybersecurity breach, or should I say a data breach, right? There is now a positive duty upon you as a responsible party to number one, notify the data subjects whose information has been breached, and number two, you have to self report to the regulator. And in self-reporting, you have to say what happened, how you are dealing with it, how you intend to deal with it, and if there are serious breaches, how you maybe intend to compensate the people or any other measures that you intend to put in place. Now, there's a big contention about when do you notify the data subject, right? Um, there's a new convention by the Council of Europe called Convention 108 Plus, right? GDPR talks about immediately. We talk about reasonably. 108 Plus talks about as soon as reasonably possible. So we've noticed that immediately is a very, very harsh standard, don't you think? In particular, because there is this, there's this rider here that says, as much as you must, within a reasonable time, report to the data subject and report to the authority, the information regulator, it must not do so and impede a criminal investigation. Hence again, remember we said data protection, cyber crime, cyber security, they are all from a common grandmother called vulnerability. <laughs> okay? So for that reason, it is very, very important that if it, ha if it takes place and if there are criminal activities, you have to carefully assess, together with whoever's investigating the matter of the SAPS, when it will be okay to notify the data subjects. All right? And then also you have to notify, self-report to the regulator and tell the regulator what steps you have taken. <coughs> In most cases, if you self-report and you, and you tell what you've done and really, really there was nothing that you could do, I don't see the regulator taking any hard steps against you in the future. However, if you were negligent, then that is something else, right? If you're negligent, or if you didn't care, or if you didn't self-report, then I think things will be happening in a different way. The, the regulator has been benchmarking. We've been benchmarking ICO in the UK. We've been benchmarking the regulator in Canada. 
as well as several regulators in Europe. So you can accept that as much as it's an African data model, data protection model, uh, the influence of the GDPR, the influence of Convention 108 plus and those are definitely going to be there in the interpretation of our statute. Um, Prof, um, do I still have time? Chair? Ma'am, do I still? Yes? Okay. Just uh, an overview of some of the data breaches that you heard about over the last couple of, uh, should I say, months, right? Liberty, Facebook, the view finds one. So some interesting things there. All right, so we're actually done. <laughs>